my name is Kelsey. I am a registered dietitian here in San Diego. I have my own private practice up in, if anyone's familiar with the area, up in uh, Sorrento Valley area. I do, well, I'm currently working towards my specialization in autoimmune GI issues. Um, so I'm not a specialist yet, so I want to put that put out that out there. But I'm currently working towards that. Um, but I've been in the field for, um, gosh, five six years now. So I'd like to think I kind of know what I'm talking about. So <laughs> hopefully you guys. Um, you know more than us. Fair enough. <laughs> All right. I'm the expert. Yes. Um, so I do have Renee's name up here. She has given this presentation over the, the preceding year, and she um, contacted me this past year. She had a, uh, another engagement to attend, so she contacted me to give this presentation, and she was kind enough to really go over what she has covered in the past years and what's been um, kind of a hot topic. So I had to put her name up here because she was so graceful and generous of uh, kind of helping me out with this presentation. So, without further ado, we can go ahead and get started. Um, so, the topic nutrition and myositis with emphasis on um, inflammation. So today I want to go over, just explain what healthy eating is in general. The slides are posted, um, so hopefully you guys all have access to those so you don't feel like you have to be writing down a bunch of notes. But um, if I just go too fast, just raise your hand and I'll kind of slow down a little bit. So we're going to go over healthy eating in general. We're going to review nutrition abnormal abnormalities in chronic disease. And we're also going to describe the dietary interventions and supplements uh, specifically related to myositis. So we are what we are thanks to our genes and our environment. A lot of things um, do come down to our genetic predisposition for certain disease, uh, disease states. However, we, are, we do have somewhat control and we can um, do some interventions specifically nutrition related to really reduce the risk for diabetes, heart disease, cancer, Alzheimer's, a lot of these other major <coughs> chronic diseases that we all are going to be uh, predisposed to. While we're going to start really talking about what are the nutrition uh, interventions for all major chronic disease states in the beginning, well, then we'll get more specific in myositis. Can we I, get any louder? We can't hardly hear you back here. Okay. Do we need. So it's not rocket science. Eat nutritious foods, include balance, moderation, variety into your diet. Be mindful of portion sizes, enjoy your meals, be involved in food prep. We've all heard of these things, so why is it sometimes so difficult? So hopefully at the end of our presentation, we'll have a better understanding of what does this healthy eating look like and how is it more attainable, more realistic, more practical for everyday living? Because we all know, like, eat your fruits and vegetables. Okay, we get it, but how do we make this um, more realistic, maybe more sustainable, more long-term, as well as include things that have, research has shown to be um, more beneficial when combating chronic diseases in different states of the myositis. So we're first going to start talking about carbohydrates. So carbohydrates with a low glycemic load and high in fiber, protein, and vitamins and minerals offer the most nutrition. When we start talking about glycemic load, what that means is that how much does that carbohydrate food item raise our blood sugar level? So we want low glycemic foods in order to prevent huge spikes in our blood sugar levels. This is gonna really help combat against development of diabetes, heart disease, aid in weight management. So this is kind of, um, Pretty important. And so what are these foods? They're whole grains, whole wheat products, brown rice, oatmeal, fruits, whole fruits and vegetables, beans, sweet potatoes, and you can keep reading. <laughs> so what are high glycemic foods? So things we start needing to slowly maybe minimizing from our diet. White breads, pastas, white rice, cookies, cakes, Pastries. I know. It's so sad. But remember, I did say in the preceding slide, moderation, balance, variety. Am I telling you guys never to eat a piece of cake again? Oh, heck no. That'd be terrible. Cake is delicious. 
But how do we start including, maybe reducing the frequency of these white products and filling the majority of our diet with these whole grain brown products? So maybe have a piece of cake once a week. Maybe have a cookie a couple times a week and start really focusing on these types of foods, okay? So like I said, balance, moderation, and variety in carbo carbohydrate intake to maximize nutrient intake. I like this saying, eat the rainbow. Um, if you guys do not know, so every single different color that is in our food represents a different vitamin or mineral. That's how um, vitamins show themselves in foods. So every color, whether it's red from tomatoes, orange from carrots, they're all a different vitamin, a different nutrient. So if we have all these different colors in our uh, diet, that honestly means we are literally maximizing our nutrient intake. Um, super trendy, juicing versus smoothies, different versus whole foods. I get this question all the time. What is better? Do we need to be juicing our foods? Do we need to be making smoothies, eating in the whole fruit state? So I like to say, if we take an orange, we have an orange, it's about this big, we peel it, we eat it, great, one orange. How many oranges do you think it takes to make eight ounces of orange juice? Ten. Six. It's kind of like six or seven. So, we start talking about sugar. How much sugar do you think is in the orange juice versus the whole orange? We're talking like six or seven times the amount of what is actually in that whole orange product. Our body loves fruit and vegetables in its whole form. Because not only do we get the vitamins and minerals, but we're also getting all the fiber, the roughage, which is so important for us. I'm not saying you can never have a, gr a green juice, but we want to make sure we're not drinking our fruits and vegetables. We need to also be eating them. So I like to say whole fruit first, then smoothies, because we're kind of throwing everything in there, right? We're still getting the bulk. We're still getting that roughage. We're still getting the fiber, along with our, our nutrients, the vitamins and minerals. And then maybe juice every once in a while, because we're missing out on that fiber and we're just getting that solely concentrated, not only sugar, but we're still getting some vitamins and minerals. We also have to remember that as soon as we juice a product, all those vitamins and minerals are gonna be exposed to the air and through a process called oxidation, you literally have to drink that juice within a couple minutes or all those vitamins and minerals are going to disappear. So, start with whole fruit, then smoothies, then juice every once in a while. Make sense, hopefully, okay. Um, another slogan, fight the white. So talking about white breads, grains versus whole wheat breads. So try to aim at least half your carbohydrates brown, whole wheat, okay? So at least half. So once again, brown rice, quinoa, 100% whole wheat. If we start looking at the nutrition labels of our packages, the first, within the first two ingredients list, there should be something that says 100% whole wheat. That's how you know the majority of that product is whole grain. Okay. We were just told wheat is bad. We'll get there. Promise. Okay. Once again, blanket statements sometimes are hard. We'll get there, I promise. Okay. Carbohydrates continued. So high fructose corn syrup. So in general, we want to start staying away from high fructose corn syrup. The long-term effects are similar to alcohol due to its metabolism in the liver. So high fructose corn syrup is a, um, has essentially been produced as a very cheap, quick, and inexpensive sugar um, product. So a lot of our pop, a lot of our packaged um, products are going to have high fructose corn syrup. So we need to check the ingredients list on our products and just be mindful if it says high fructose corn syrup because we want to start staying away from those. Um, so yes, it, it, does, it may increase the risk for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Um, we also want to start avoiding soda and diet soda. So regular soda does contain high fructose corn syrup. There are some sodas now that um, contain regular sugar, I think, um, given the, the hype around high fructose corn syrup, uh, a lot of people are starting to make products with real sugar. Um, 
But diet soda actually uh, contains artificial sweeteners that does disrupt our gut microbiome. And we will discuss that further later on in the presentation of what's so important of our gut. Um, both contain phosphoric acid, which does destroy bones. So um, that in itself is uh, going to be a good one to avoid. Okay. All right, moving on. Protein. So studies, that sh studies have shown that people who follow the Mediterranean diet or a plant-based um, vegetarian diet have the lowest risk of chronic disease. We'll get more in depth of what the Mediterranean diet looks like. Um, so what types of proteins? Lean meats, chicken, turkey, pork, not sausages or bacon, like pork loins, the lean cuts of pork. Fish, beans, nuts, tofu, low-fat dairy, eggs. So these are all going to be um, more nutritious sources of lean protein. Avoid red meat, fatty meats, bacon, sausage, fried meats, so our, our drumsticks, chicken fried drumsticks. So do I, am I saying that you always, you can never eat a steak again? No, that'd be miserable. But how do we start maybe saving a, a, a portion of red meat, having a steak one time a week? Maybe once every other week. Save these for special occasions. They do taste delicious, but we seem to start choosing the majority of our proteins from these lean meat category. Totally. If you would wait until you get a microphone to ask a question, that way everybody can get to hear the question. Well, mm -hmm. while you yeah. have everybody decided that we'll go through the yeah. lecture part first, right. and then yeah. people can ask Oh, there you go. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We can definitely talk about that. Yes. Um, so how much protein are in these food items? So I just made a list of kind of getting a general sense of how much protein is are in different food items. So I have Greek yogurt, 23 grams of protein, cottage cheese, regular cheese, eggs, milk, chicken, just to give you a sense of how much protein are in these items, and we'll talk about portion sizes, the amount of protein needed throughout the day. So this is kind of for your general reference. Hopefully everyone has access to the slides. Um, I guess I can say it now. Um, so rule of thumb, try to aim for 15 to 20 grams of protein per meal. I'll once again be talking about this in a few slides for portion sizes in general, but just so you guys get an idea of um, what this really looks like. So three ounces of chicken breast at dinner, that is a great source of protein. It would meet that requirement, okay? All right, dietary fat. So we start talking about these healthy, more nutritious types of fats. Uh, the first category is our monounsaturated fatty acids or our MUFAs. So these are found in foods and oils. Uh, they are found to improve cholesterol levels and decrease risk for cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes. Sources include olive oil, almonds, cashews, pecans, canola oil, avocados, nut butters, and so forth. And then we have our PUFAs, our polyunsaturated fatty acids, once again found in plant-based foods and oils. Decreased cholesterol levels and decreased risk for cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes. They are mostly liquid at room temperature, so mostly our oils, um, walnuts, sunflower seeds, flax seeds, and then our soybean oil, safflower oil. And then omega-3 fatty acids. This is a type of polyunsaturated fat with um, a ton of research around it. So if we were to hone in on a specific fat, this is like that, that gold one. Um, it is very beneficial for the heart as it's shown to decrease risk of coronary heart disease. Found in plant and animal-based foods, salmon, tuna, trout, flax seeds, canola oil, walnuts, sunflower seeds. Um, and so when we start talking about omega-3s, so our society currently does have a balance between omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids. And this, uh, a lot of research has shown that this is, um, is a uh, precursor or a major factor for heart disease. 
Um, Omega-3s are anti-inflammatory. So our salmons, the, the foods I just listed before. So they are shown to be anti-inflammatory, where our omega-6 is actually pro-inflammatory. So ideally, they should be at a one-to-one -one ratio. So for how many uh, omega-6 we should be eating, we should be eating equal amounts of omega-3. Right now, our ratio is 10 to 1 to 15 to 1. So our omega-6 is far outweighing our omega-3, uh, which is a problem. We ideally want to get them back to a 1 to 1 ratio. So what does um, omega-6 look like? I'm going to skip ahead. So omega-6 is um, linoleic acid. It is an essential fatty acid. So yes, we do need this, but in smaller amounts. So our safflower oils, our sunflower oils, grape seeds, soy soybean, corn oil. The reason why I think we're eating so many of this is because soybean oil and corn oil are used in a lot of packaged products. So it's a very cheap and inexpensive oil. So the more packaged foods we eat, the higher our omega-6 to omega-3 ratio we're going to have naturally. So the more we get back to this whole foods um, approach to eating, we're going to naturally start balancing out this ratio. Let me skip ahead. Okay. So breaking down this omega-3 category um, further, so we do have our alpha-linolenic acid. It is an essential fatty acid, so our body cannot produce this on its own. That's what essential means. And this is our flaxseed, our canola oil, walnuts, enrich enriched eggs. So these are going to be crucial to start eating. Our body can make the next type of omega-3 fatty acids, our EPAs and DHAs, from our ALAs. Okay, so we need to eat these in order for our body to make these. But we can also eat these too. So EPA found in fish, fish oil, other marine sources, algae is one of them. Um, DHA, fish, fish oil, enriched eggs. Okay, so once again, our body can convert ALA into these products. And we'll, we'll talk about fish oil supplements um, later on in the lecture. Um, there have been studies to show that eating oily, wild-caught fish one to three times a week may be enough to meet this requirement. Um, examples, so um, salmon, mackerel, sardines, um, one to three times a week. We want to go for our wild, um, wild-caught, I don't think that's a phrase. Somewhere in the package it should say wild, because um, we don't want a, a farm-raised salmon. We want a salmon out in Alaska, swimming around in the wilds, eating all this good type of um, foods in the ocean. So it should say wild on our fish products. Um, we can, if that's for some reason, if we're like a total fish hater, then we can supplement. Um, look for distilled fish or krill oil, two to three grams per day as a supplement. Um, avoid if on blood thinners or if there's an upcoming surgery because it does um, uh, have an increased risk of thinning our blood, okay? Um, as a word of caution too, as we start talking about supplements, um, your doctors are gonna know, um, have a better idea of your specific case, what's going on, and whether or not give that final say on if anything might be um, contraindicated, so going against what, he, what they think is appropriate. So I kinda wanna throw that out there too as I start making these recommendations. Um, just be mindful, maybe getting clearance from your doctor too to make sure with, with medications you're taking um, that everything looks okay. You don't realize how much like arm movements you do until you start presenting. I'm like, okay, I might be getting a little obsessive here. Okay, um, so what to avoid? So saturated fat uh, mainly comes from animal sources of food. Studies have shown that it raises LDL, or our bad cholesterol levels. Um, examples include butter, <coughs> cream, full-fat milk, cheese, beef, um, pork in the form of sausage or bacon, processed meats, skin on chicken. I promise we'll talk about the point you brought up. Um, so rule of thumb, start limiting saturated fats. 
trans fats. So trans fats is actually, uh, we have made this fat component. It is a, through the process of hydrogenation of vegetable oils. Studies have shown that it does increase LDL cholesterol and lowers our HDL. So not only does it increase the bad cholesterol, it actually lowers our good one as well. So we definitely want to stay away from this one. Um, so this is once again in our package delicious tasting food items, donuts, cookies, muffins, pies. So once again, I'm not saying you have to completely limit these items from our diet. That would be a very sad world. But once again, how do we start limiting them out? We're eating these things. So instead of maybe a donut every morning, how do you have a donut every other morning to start? So once again, start slowly cutting back on these types of food items. Um, I want to talk about the, I get this question a lot, like what type of oil do we cook with? Um, so when we start talking about what oils are best, I reference the smoke point. So the smoke point is the, is the temperature in which an oil turns from a delicious sauteing oil into an actually, it starts burning and releases free radicals that studies have shown that can actually cause cancer. So. We're cooking, when we're frying something uh, on high heat over the stove, we want to go for an oil that has a really high smoke point because it can stand really high temperatures. So I like um, cooking for frying something on the stove with an avocado oil or an extra light olive oil. These are great kind of um, doing a quick stir fry over the oven. If we're doing a nice saute, not over medium heat over the oven, then we can say we can do a refined canola oil, we can do a even refined coconut oil, because um, our temperatures aren't getting too hot again. If we're baking something in the oven, you know, just be mindful of what temperature we're going to. If we're cooking something at 400 degrees, then okay, yes, you can use these types of oils. Um, up here, maybe um, avoid these ones. If your oven's at 350, then we can go down here into the olive oil. Um, I always say, just to be careful, our, our extra virgin olive oil, which is um, very, very popular, maybe save that for salads and dipping into breads, um, just to avoid any sort of um, issue that might happen. Okay. All right, so portions. So um, fruits, two whole fruits per day is kind of the standard. If you kind of hear of the um, five a day, that's kind of in conjunction with vegetables. So I always say kind of two servings of fruit, um, three serving of vegetables. So once again, this kind of goes back to why um, juicing might be an issue because if we're juicing, we're eating maybe six or seven fruits a day, not, not our two fruits a day. Vegetables, two to three one cup servings. Um, I, I would like to say that fried veggies, deep fried veggies count, but let's say with our raw or lightly sauteed vegetables, so be mindful of the preparation. Um, my sister loves a deep fried zucchini and I always tell her, I'm like, mm, that doesn't really count, but all right, they're delicious. Um, protein, um, how do we calculate our protein needs? So rule of thumb, 0.8 to one gram per kilogram of body weight a day. So what does this look like? So take your weight, divide it by 2.2. That is kilograms, how much we weigh in kilograms. So for example, 150 pound person would weigh roughly 70 kilograms. Then we time, uh, times that by 0.8 to one. We get that nice little range. And so it's about 55 grams, I'm totally walking the little words, 55 grams of protein per day. So that's kind of how we'd calculate our protein needs in general. Um, I already said as a, uh, before, as a rule of thumb, 15 to 20 grams per meal um, is a good place to start. And then dietary fat, it does depend on body weight, age, height, rule of thumb, include a source of healthy fat at each meal. Okay, um, I totally missed starches, I don't know why I skipped over that, but also it depends on body weight, age, height, but I think the, the key is make half of your grains whole grains. Okay, okay. so what does this anti-inflammatory diet or uh, kind of synonymous with our Mediterranean diet uh, look like? So we're gonna minimize sugar and refined grains, focus on whole grains, we've talked about that. Include sources of lean, low-fat animal proteins, limit red meat, fried meats, fatty meats. We talked about that. 
Increase fruit and vegetable intake, maybe focus on our whole fruits and vegetables. Um, include beans, nuts, seeds, herbs, and spices. We'll talk about herbs and spices in a minute. Uh, limit alcohol and caffeine intake. We will talk about that in a minute. Include fermented foods, probiotics, prebiotics, and fiber-rich foods. We'll also talk about that. And increase omega-3 in monounsaturated fats. Limit omega-6, <coughs> trans, and saturated fats. So this is essentially when people start talking about the Mediterranean diet, the anti-inflammatory diet. This is what this is starting to look like. Okay. <coughs> So specific anti-inflammatory foods. Studies have shown that these foods are, have some of the highest anti-inflammatory compounds to really um, fight inflammation in our bodies. Um, we start talking about inflammation in terms of our bodies. Inflammation, why it's such a, a buzz word. Uh, inflammation has been linked to a lot of chronic disease states. All of them, to be honest. So this is, across the board, something that is incredibly beneficial. So vitamin D, we'll talk about this one specifically when we get to the supplements. Fish oil, omega-3s, <laughs> talked about that. Dark chocolate, 85% and higher. So milk chocolate, yes, it tastes delicious, but we're going for those antioxidant, anti-inflammatory compounds. We want the darker, the better. So look for 85% and above. Turmeric um, kind of goes with, we have cumin on here, so we start thinking of Thai food, that very specific flavor. That's the turmeric. We'll talk about that in supplements. Ginger, garlic, red chili peppers, pomegranates, and you can continue reading. Um, so once again, this is for your reference, and these are just foods that are some of the highest in these antioxidant, anti-inflammatory compounds. Um, so in a 2007 study, um, the, it found that those with myositis who followed an anti-inflammatory diet over 12 weeks had improved grip, arm, and leg strength me measurements, ease of routine of activities, and severity, increased severity of depression. Um, so this, I totally stole this from her name, so that's why I had to include her name on there. But um, I kept this study up here, but a lot of studies after it, so I know 2007 is kind of far back there. But studies after study have shown that um, the Mediterranean diet has been uh, highly researched and proven to be uh, very beneficial. All right, so what are antioxidants? So antioxidants protect the body from free radicals, and these are substances that can cause chronic disease with extra emphasis on heart disease and cancer. It includes vitamins, for example, A, C, and E, as well as minerals, selenium, calcium, etc. And as a rule of thumb, I always kind of say it's best to start with whole foods first. Supplements may not be as effective and can even cause more harm. And the reason why I put that is because, once again, our bodies know exactly what to do with whole foods. We, our bodies were made designed real food. And as soon as we start introducing uh, very high concentrations of a specific nutrient, our body can get confused and maybe not utilize it um, to the utmost of its capacity. Of course, there are supplements we'll talk about that studies have shown to be um, you know, different cases. But just as a rule of thumb, start with whole foods first, and then with the direction of a dietitian or doctor, we can start really experimenting with supplements. Um, I also included a list of foods that have been shown to have really high antioxidant um, factors, so herbs and spices, berries, red wine. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, purple grapes, green and black tea, citrus fruits, legumes, nuts and seeds, and once again, dark chocolate. Okay. All right. So caffeine. So caffeine ideally should be 8 to 16 ounces per day. Increased amounts have been shown to be pro-inflammatory. So we start talking about caffeine. It includes coffee, green or black tea, energy drinks, which I don't recommend drinking in general, um, and diet or regular soda, which once again, I do not recommend drinking. So coffee does have really great antioxidant compounds, but when we start getting above this eight to 16 ounces a day, actually has been shown to be pro-inflammatory. Same for green and black tea. Although they, they do have strong antioxidant compounds, that can, the caffeine can negate those effects and be pro-inflammatory, okay? 
8 to 16 ounces is kind of this threshold of what is beneficial, what has that antioxidant capacity for our bodies. We start getting into three, four, five cups of coffee a day, it can start having some issues. Alcohol. So number one, consult with your doctor if this is even allowed. There's a lot of um, issues with alcohol and medication. So I need to throw that out there is that this needs to be 100% cleared by the doctor depending on medications, diagnosis, etc. For those of you who haven't been cleared to drink alcohol, the recommendation is one drink a day per women, two drinks per day for men. So what does this look like? 12 ounces of beer, five ounces of wine, one shot of liquor. So I like to include this in there because I always get questions about it, oddly enough. Um, so just for your reference, so a glass of wine is about five ounces. That's, that's how much, not our delightful large size, okay? So once again, I talked about the antioxidant capacity of red wine. It does have been shown to have antioxidants, but anything more than our one five ounce glass of wine for women can be pro-inflammatory and kind of start negating, um, uh, opposing those, those antioxidant properties. Okay. How are we doing on time? Okay, good. Um, Another thing is salt. So high levels of sodium intake has been linked to increased inflammatory markers in autoimmune diseases. So we, um, a lot of our salt, or um, synonymous with sodium, is found in packaged food items. So once again, getting back to these whole foods and reducing the amount of packaged foods. If we do need to um, go for packaged or canned food products, which sometimes that's the reality of our situation, they're very easy, they're very convenient, just look for low sodium or no salt added on these packaged food products. Um, the recommended intake is 12 to 15 milligrams, just for your reference. One teaspoon of table salt has 2,300 milligrams of uh, sodium. So maybe avoid the salt shaker or just do a nice little quick, uh, what is that? I was gonna say a tap, that's a dash. A dash of salt um, rather than going for it, okay? Um, Another random fact I love, McDonald's Big Breakfast with hotcakes is about 2,260 milligrams of sodium. So it's in there, that's why they taste so delicious. So start cutting back on prepackaged cans, um, foods, or looking for low sodium, no salt added on these food items. Okay. If my voice starts getting low again, just like let me know. Is that per day? Yes, per day. I know. I know. What is your view of iodized salt versus kosher salt, which is not iodized? Salt is salt is salt. I understand, but yeah. is there any benefit to the iodine? Yeah, so iodized salt just has iodine in it. Um, it Yes, so if you have certain disease states that need more iodine in it, then yes. If your doctor says your eye, there's no reason why you should need iodine, then you don't need iodized salt. So whether it's, um, so that's that little thing. Some people say sea salt is better or pink Himalayan salt is better. And I'm like, it's just still salt. Um, so yes, I don't know if I answered your question, hopefully. Okay, so I started a little example meal plan. What does this look like when it all starts coming together? Breakfast, one cup of coffee with a tablespoon of creamer and one teaspoon sugar. Oatmeal topped with three-fourths cup berries and some walnuts. Snack, apple and almond butter. Lunch, turkey and avocado sandwich on whole grain bread with a side of Greek yogurt with honey and flax seeds. Snack, carrots and hummus. Dinner, some salmon with brown rice and uh, steamed vegetables. And dessert, a piece of dark chocolate. Obviously, this is going to vary greatly depending on your specific needs, but just an example of what this can all start looking like. Okay. All right, so our gut. So our gut, um, our gut bacteria and yeast play a role in immune function and regulation of inflammation. Um, so this is kind of uh, 
a, hot, a topic of hot discussion right now. There is 100 trillion bacteria and yeast cells in our human gut, and our bacteria genes outnumber our human genes by a hundredfold. <laughs> So our, our bacteria, there's more bacteria in us than our human cells. So a huge topic right now on um, our gut microbiome. This is what I love. So i all about it. Um, so dysbiosis is the imbalance in gut bacteria, which has been shown to play a major role in inflammation and chronic disease. Um, there is an observed increase in autoimmune diseases in those with uh, dysbiosis. Okay. Um, those with altered gut flora have slower metabolism and higher risk for obesity. Therefore, obviously, improving our intestinal gut flora does improve inflammation. The use of probiotic in mice, um, studies have seen that um, it has improved or prevented rheumatoid arthritis, MS, type 1 diabetes, um, and we will once again discuss probiotics later on. So what do these good bacteria look like? What do we need to start repopulating our gut with? First one is kefir. It is a fermentable, drinkable yogurt. Choose plain varieties. Um, if you think, uh, think of Greek yogurt, but it's a little more liquidy um, in the refrigerated section. I know Trader Joe's has it, Whole Foods has it, Sprouts has it. Um, it's a little potent. It definitely tastes healthy. So uh, maybe add a little sugar, uh, maybe some honey, just a little, little dash, uh, to maybe some fruit to kind of, you know, liven it up a little bit. Uh, kombucha, once again, very trendy right now. Uh, it tastes healthy. So uh, we can go for some, like, mango-flavored varieties to kind of um, up the palatable, uh, palatableness of it. I don't know if that's a word, but now it is. Uh, sauerkrauts, um, fermented, fermented cabbage, I, hopefully we're all familiar with what sauerkraut is. Uh, pickles, no one usually knows that pickles are fermented cucumbers, um, so they have probiotics. Tempeh, a fermented soybean product, so think of tofu, and this has been fermented longer, so it's just a harder, thicker, meatier version of tofu. Um, and then yogurt, we want to go for our Greek yogurt or just plain um, plain varieties of regular yogurt. So once again, these are all going to be high in those good types of probiotics to really start repopulating our gut. Um, yeah. All right, some obstacles to dietary changes. So some barriers, um, different habits we have, cultural religious considerations, access to fresh and healthy foods, ability to buy, prepare, and cook food dysphagia, difficulty swallowing, poor dentition. So we start talking about it like, oh yeah, it's just eat healthy, include fruits and vegetables. We don't really talk about like, what are these barriers? So in order to really start um, overcoming these barriers, speaking with registered dietitians that can, op that can provide more specific um, interventions for, for um, everybody. Um, occupational speech therapy to really work with the dysphagia, Grocery delivery and food preparation services. Um, Amazon Fresh is fabulous. They've kind of really um, uh, done grocery delivering very well. I know Vaughn's delivers. And there's a lot of um, HelloFresh, uh, Blue Apron, a lot of these meal delivery services that will kind of drop off ingredients um, to your door that can really help with this food preparation piece. And then regular dental exams to really help with the poor, um, poor dentition. All right, so just some, some summaries. Current studies right now for muscle recovery and strength, adequate protein intake. So I did show you how to calculate protein needs. Um, high intake of omega-3s, I listed those. High intake of antioxidants, medium to high intake of those good monounsaturated fats, polyunsaturated fats. So a lot of research is really honing in on these components right now in terms of muscle recovery and strength. Uh, BMI and chronic disease, increased BMI is associated with increased inflammation due to the effect of adipose fat, cells release of um, meteors like cytokines. 
for um, psoriasis severity and autoimmune disease improves with weight loss. So once again, looking at, I just include these. BMI is a, uh, a factor in inflammation. So working really with a, your doctor or dietitian to really maybe help that would be uh, help with the inflammation states as well. Um, I included this study, once again, stole it from Renee. Uh, it was looking at um, a study from the European Society of Cardiology. Those who ate a mainly Mediterranean diet were 37% less likely to die during the study than those who were furthest from this dietary pattern. So they looked at diet interventions and the use of statins, and which, were, um, which had a greater effect on cardiovascular health and overall life. Um, statins are said to help reduce major heart problems by around 24%. So the study was um, pretty amazing in the sense that it really highlighted how much a, a dietary intervention can make on overall health when compared to medications. Um, so it was previously believed that cholesterol-lowering drugs such as statins were believed to be the most effective, um, but that research is showing that dietary interventions can really have a great impact on health as well. Um, please, if you guys are on statins, do not stop taking your statins. It's the combination effect can, is very helpful as well. So not only do we, um, I guess, overarching theme here is not only are medications important, but so is our diet. Our diet plays a huge role in our health. Um, okay, so we're going to start talking about supplements. Let's see what time. Okay, um, so uh, curcumin is the active ingredient in turmeric. So once again, start thinking of our curries, Thai foods, that, that very specific flavor. is That's what I'm talking about. Um, it is very anti-inflammatory. It is poorly absorbed. It needs to be combined with black pepper extract. So if we start looking at supplements, look for uh, curcumin with bio uh, pairing and uh, that is gonna help increase the absorption. And studies have shown it's been possibly effective for high cholesterol, cholesterol, geez, um, osteoarthritis, Alzheimer's, and cancer. Um, there was a study in 2007 in mice that um, it reduced inflammation and production of creatine kinase associated with exercise-induced muscle damage. There's also a 2008 study that it enhanced muscle strength in mice with muscular dystrophy. So as you're seeing, a lot of these studies are in mice right now. Um, so that is hopefully the, the direction of more of these studies is human subjects. So it usually does not cause any significant side effects. However, avoid if on blood thinners, if you have a bleeding disorder prior to surgery or if you're on anticoagulants. Once again, this does have a blood thinning effect. Um, avoid if acid reflux is present as it could cause further irritation. Um, the dosage is about 1,500 milligrams daily by mouth. Okay, so we don't look for an oral supplement. Okay, CoQ10. A lot of the research right now is in statin-induced myopathy. So CoQ10 affects energy metabolism and acts like an antioxidant. Lowered CoQ10 levels have been found in some people with muscle diseases. A reduction in CoQ10 could cause abnormal mitochondrial dysfunction, which once again is linked to muscle diseases. Um, statins also lower CoQ10, but most studies have not shown that supplements increase levels. Unfortunately, the, the research on CoQ10 is very conflicting right now. Um, so there has been studies that showed um, and uh, 50 patients showed decrease in muscle pain after 30 days with CoQ10, 50 milligrams twice daily compared with the placebo. So this was a positive study of the muscle pain with CoQ10 supplementation. Um, there is another study that showed that um, CoQ10 supplementation and statin-induced myopathy. There, there wasn't a strong evidence for that. Um, and there was another study done that showed no improvement in muscle pain or muscle, muscle strength or aerobic performance after eight weeks of 600 milligrams of CoQ10. Um, so once again, every body, every body literally is different. Some respond well and some don't feel it. So when we start talking about supplements, 
there's not a one size fits all. It's how do we explore these things in a safe way for, a, for every individual to see if there is any changes. Um, as we age, CoQ10 abs absorption, biosynthesis, and conversion to ubiquinol decreases. And so ubiquinol is the form better absorbed and more effective by our body. So if we are looking at um, supplementation, we want to go for the ubiquinol form. Um, there is strong interest in cardiac, neurologic, and periodontal diseases with CoQ10. Um, so if there are any of those types of issues going on, CoQ10 could be a supplement worth looking into. The dose is 150 milligrams daily of ubiquinol. And once again, avoid if on Coumadin. Okay. Vitamin D. Um, so vitamin D is important for bone health and mental health, depression, anxiety, etc. Um, vitamin, vitamin D levels are decreased by steroid use, so it's very important that we're continuing getting these checked by your doctor. Studies have shown that patients with um, DM, PM, RA, lupus have been found to be def deficient in vitamin D. Um, I hope if I use the, the abbreviations DM, PM, we all know what we're talking about, but just so you guys know, I wrote the, the whole word out there. Sorry, my voice is getting a little scratchy. Just to check for you. Yep. All right. Okay. Um, I t <laughs> tough crowd, tough crowd. Um, okay, studies. Vitamin D supplementation in statin-induced myositis patients reversed symptoms in 80%, 87% of um, patients studied. Treatment for deficiency, so if there is a deficiency present, looking for 2,000 IUs per day of vitamin D3 or 50,000 weekly of vitamin D2. They're just different forms, but we can talk with the dietitian or doctor what form would be best for you. Recheck levels after six weeks of supplements. So it's, uh, it does take a little while for the levels to go back up. Um, Folate, folic acid, important to take if on methotrexate to avoid decreased white blood cells, GI symptoms, hair loss. Um, supplement as one to two milligrams daily. Unclear if we should avoid it on the same day as methotrexate, still being studied. Um, we also need adequate B12 intake because folate can mask a B12 deficiency. So B12, um, good sources, fish, shellfish, beef, eggs, nutritional yeast, um, any animal product really will have B12 in it. Folate can mask a B12 deficiency. Oh, okay. Yeah. So can you mask a B12 deficiency? So if we have a, uh, if we're taking folate supplementation, we could have a B12 deficiency and folate can kind of uh, mask that. I don't know why it's repeated the same thing twice. There you go. Okay, probiotics. Rule of thumb, there are thousands of different strains out there. Research is still being concluded on what type of strain is best for which disease state. My rule of thumb, look for a probiotic supplement that has um, five or plus different strains and in the dosing of billions. So start with maybe a five billion probiotic with maybe four to five different strains in there. If you go to Whole Foods, Sprout, some of these places, they can have some recommendations or talk to a dietitian or a doctor. Okay. Yes, they can be expensive. Once again, um, if, if cost is an issue, go back to that slide where it had the kefir, the yogurt, all those are gonna have those beneficial bacteria as well. Okay, we're going, we're going. Whey protein has been looked as a dietary source of cysteine, which is needed for uh, glutathione production, an important, an important element in antioxidant defense. Glutathione itself, as an oral supplement, is not well absorbed. That's why there is a uh, focus on the whey protein. This may be helpful for autoimmune disease and myopathies, but data is limited. Okay, typical dose is 2, 2D. 20 to 30 grams daily, higher intake may cause intestinal discomfort. And we're going. Uh, glutamine, because it inhibits muscle wasting and preserves muscle protein, it may help um, muscular dystrophy, myotonic, can raise methotrexate levels, so there is still no good data right now on myositis. 
Creatine taken as a daily supplement to improve muscle strength and our mass. Um, there has been a study in 2013 that did deem it a worthwhile supplement with few side effects. Um, there was another study taken in 2007, and that study started with 20 grams per day for eight days and continued with three grams per day. Noted improved performance, ability to undertake high intensity um, exercise and endurance work, and the effect was maintained over five months. Okay, no side effects. Um, other supplements, vitamin C and E, there's no good data on these right now. L-carnitine, once again, no good data. Um, some things that did show to cause some harm, spirulina, blue, green algae, echinacea, um, mm -hmm. did show to um, have flare-ups of autoimmune conditions, so avoiding these might be necessary. <laughs> Biotin, uh, biotin has been in the past suggested um, for hair loss. And DM, the, the dosing is uh, 12,000 or 10 milligrams uh, twice daily. But this will not help the skin disease itself. It will help with the hair, hair loss piece. Um, getting into the ketogenic diet, gluten-free diet, and lectins have been recently looked at. So ketogenic, ketogenic diet is similar to Atkins, high fat, moderate protein, low carb. Um, it is right now the main diet in the treatment of seizure disorder. However, there is preliminary data that it might improve muscle performers, uh, performance in Alzheimer's. Um, it's also being studied in humans with very, various muscular diseases right now as well. So there's a lot of research being done on this. Um, once again, if this is something you want to explore, you can actually do that and see if it, it makes you feel better. This is a trial and error, trial and error per individual. Uh, gluten sensitivity. So there's been a lot of research in uh, gluten sensitivity in this population. For some of the uh, different forms, there has been studies that have shown that there is a high prevalence of gluten sensitivity in myositis. So once again, um, really looking at the specific dietary intervention, working with a dietitian, doctor on how, how to do this, how to implement a gluten-free diet. Um, the problem with testing is that not all patients have a positive reaction to gluten, um, lab work-wise, but some symptoms can include weight loss, abdominal cramping, bloating, loose stools, or just GI issues in general, um, anemia, evidence of bone loss, vitamin E deficiency. So although you might not test positive for a gluten allergy, these are some symptoms that, um, that a sensitivity might be present. So what are gluten-free foods? So these are gluten-containing foods, wheat. Um, we have that over here, barley, couscous, just flour, cereal grains in general. Naturally gluten-free foods are gonna be the brown rice, quinoa, millet, the ones on the right, okay? Many gluten-free foods, gluten-free bread, gluten-free pastas are available and they're made out of these, those ones and avoid the, the wheat products. <laughs> Um, lectins are proteins found in certain vegetables such as beans, grains, and corn. There has been um, some hype right now about doing a lectin-free diet. Um, there is n no good, no good studies. There hasn't been a, um, a large enough study to kind of prove this yet, but once again, um, if this is something that you feel you want to explore, you can definitely do that. However, lectins are going to be found in beans, grains, fruits, and vegetables. So we need to be very conscious if we're cutting out foods with lectins in it that we're also gonna be cutting out a lot of vitamins and nutrients. So perhaps um, doing this very carefully if this is something you want to explore, okay? Um, summary, we got that. So to wrap this up, for all um, looking at vitamin D levels, seeing if this is something we need to supplement. Um, for anyone on methotrexate, Take folic acid. For PM, DM, IBM, consider a gluten free diet. For IBM, consider modified Atkins. For PM, DM, consider creatine. Um, and stay hopeful for more data on CoQ10, whey, the curcumin, uh, but it could be worth a shot. And 
I have some resources in the back, general resources, drug interactions, supplements, and some books, and we're done. We have seven minutes. <laughs> Questions. I, Thank you, Kelsey. You're I just welcome. Want to remind everybody right now that this is being recorded and it will be on the website. Um, and for expedience' sake, maybe if, you, if I don't have to move the mic around, you could just repeat the mm -hmm. question so it can be recorded well. No problem. No problem. Yes. In regards to the probiotics, yes. it seems like the over-the-counter ones you get cured, you know. Are, are not satisfying your requirements here of five different strains and billions of... Yeah, so the ones you're gonna want to look for are in the refrigerated section of health food stores. Those are gonna be the most potent, have the highest strains. There is a, um, there are a lot with different strains. So if you walk into Whole Foods and say, can you point me towards the refrigerated probiotic section and one with one in the billions with five, at least five different strains, they are, they are there. But it can be a little pricey. That's true, but it's so it sounds like you're wasting your money on getting the cultural. And yes. Well, mm, yes. Yes. <laughs> Col uh, cultural. If you guys have, if there's diarrhea present, if we're getting very specific, um, cultural has been shown to really help with that. Um, so like each strain can, can help with a different symptom. So that's why the more strains we have can help combat a lot of different symptoms. I know, I'm so sorry. So, uh, yeah, that's a tough one. Yes? Yeah, I wanted to add something that I had told Renee about. Okay. A website called Consumer Lab. Yeah. And what that gives you is it gives you a list, great, but it's, um, it gives you a list of supplements. This is like the Consumer Report of Supplements. Yes. And oh, it that? tells you what supplements do, and it also tells you which brands have what they say they have, and which brands is the cheapest by pill. Yeah. So Consumer Labs is a small fee to join. So worth it, though. It literally lists disease states, what supplements have been proven to work with those disease states, what brands are proven to be most effective within that supplement, and what is the cheapest of those brands. So it's a fabulous resource. Yeah. Can you get probiotics by prescription? Because the only probiotic, do you get probiotics by prescription? The only probiotic um, for prescription is that to treat Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. Other than that, no. It's, it's all over the counter. Yeah. I, rule of thumb, if you take a probiotic and you actually feel worse, stop taking that probiotic and go talk to a dietitian because um, that could happen and it's not, you didn't find the right strain that works best for you. Okay, yes? Yeah, well, I was just reading up on probiotics too and one of the things that I had read about was that you take these probiotics but a lot of the microbes that are in there and you're feeding them the bad stuff that you're eating and some bad ones the bad bugs that like what you're eating, so you keep generating the bad ones. So you should take the prebiotic that feed the good ones. And you didn't mention anything about prebiotics. So, pro, uh, the the bad bacteria in our gut, the one we don't want to feed, love sugar. Yeah. They love sugar. So when you start talking about taking a probiotic, we need to start eating fruits and vegetables, which are naturally prebiotics that feed the probiotics. So sh sugar will feed the, the bad bacteria. And so we need to start eating whole fruits and vegetables, which are natural prebiotics, in order to feed the good bacteria. So supplementing with prebiotics, we take the probiotics. Yeah, the question was, do we need to supplement with prebiotics in order to feed the probiotics? Not necessarily. If we eat the a natural Mediterranean type diet, there's so many natural prebiotics in that diet that we are going to be feeding the good bacteria. 
Um, if for some reason that uh, we can't get all of the recommendations in the Mediterranean type diet, then yes, we can look into a prebiotic. Um, that's definitely could could be the case. Um, Worth exploring. And it should have vitamin K in it too. It said the vitamin K helps you absorb, and a lot of the cheaper ones don't have that. So it should always have vitamin K. Mm. The question was: Is vitamin K uh, uh, necessary for probiotic? I have not. I, that's not something I typically recommend. Um, vitamin K is a fat soluble vitamin. And so unless there is some sort of um, absorption issue or um, a low levels we could supplement, that's not typically something I would naturally supplement with. But I can look more into that and see what. Oh, yeah, I don't know. Any probiotics have K in it. We have time for one more question. More question. I've seen articles both pro and con that there is, if you've got some sort of myositis, you should avoid certain vegetables like tomatoes. So, is there a comment on that? So, there will be a study. So the question was, how do we navigate the research on what is good for myositis, bad for myositis? I literally could find any sort of opinion I want on any study. Like, I can find a study that says, like, you can eat whatever you want and be cured for life. The problem is, is that who's, who's funding the study? Where is the study coming from? Um, I mean, this, uh, you can find a study for anything. So once again, every body is different. And some people tolerate nightshades. Some people don't. Um, so it is a trial and error. I always recommend uh, el el an elimination diet or exploring it for yourself of what feels good. Um, so that is a very, it's a, it's a, hard, it's a hard situation. So there isn't any firm evidence. There is no firm evidence for anything. <laughs> there is, it's, it's a big gray area. <laughs> totally, and that's why I did list it a lot. We want to thank Kelsey for her session today. Thank you all for the evaluation and let us know in the chat. We'd like to bring Kelsey back again. So uh, thank you, Kelsey. My name is Chris Harris. I have uh, dermatomyositis. I was first diagnosed in 2005. So this is my 12th year. And this is my first year to this meeting, which I'm kicking myself for. But going forward, I'll be at every one. Um, my favorite part of this meeting is meeting the patients and their advocates. And I'm amazed at the support that I've received since I've been here from everybody. And I love that people have shared their stories, no matter how challenging. But I love the idea of hope for everybody. And my second favorite part of this meeting is the individuals have, who have donated their time to move this disease forward and try to find a cure, which includes everybody with the Myositis Foundation as well as the panel. Every person who has volunteered their time, the physicians, the physical therapists, the volunteers, and the fact that they've committed to do this as they move forward is amazing to me. And I love it, and I will be here again next year and the year after that. And it just gives me a lot of hope when I was very depressed. So thank you for inviting us. Thank you for supporting it. And I look forward to seeing everybody next year. Hello, my name is Anastasia Victorson, and I came here all the way from Stockholm, Sweden. I'm very happy to be here. Is this of course, your first time coming to the MIOS uh, To this conference, yes. To the TMA conference the first time. What's it been like? It's been fantastic. Very informative. I've met my friends, my Facebook friends. and. Uh, I think, I hope I'll be able to come again. Um, I have polymyositis, but I also have a syndrome that's called the anti-synthesis syndrome. Uh, I have antibodies, a lot of them, but anti jo one is the most common one. And I also have ILD, quite serious. But getting medication, feeling quite okay. The doctor saved my life, yeah. Very good information. And it's also nice to see the persons, I read a lot. It's also nice to see them in real life, to be able to interact with the doctors. Yes, I'm just happy to be here, having met you too. Take care. And everybody else that hasn't been here, 
hasn't gotten a chance, please try, because this was really worth it. It's beyond my expectations, really. Thank you.